Welcome, Krista. Thanks so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thank you for having me. I always think it's so funny to interview someone who's written such an open memoir, right? It's such, with so much information that I'm like, well, I already know all about you. Like, let's skip to the next part. Like, what happened after the memoir? Like, let's catch up. You know, I feel like it's like we already had a conversation, but uh, uh, well, for listeners who don't know much about your book, Loved and Wanted, can you please tell them a little about what it's about? Well, um, Loved and Wanted is um, a memoir that is about my time living in West Virginia. I was a faculty member at West Virginia University, and um, my family had moved there from Los Angeles. And it's about the years that I lived in West Virginia and had a second daughter and then was unexpectedly pregnant with a third child a year after having my daughter. And I was my family's sole provider, and I couldn't afford a third baby. And so I looked into my options for reproductive health care and discovered that I didn't have any, <laughs> so, or very few, and not, not, not the kinds of options that as a mother to small children that I could take. There were waiting periods that would have caused me to have to, you know, take two weeks off of work and find someone to stay with our kids. Um, because oftentimes if you get an abortion, you have to um, have somebody come with you. And we didn't have family nearby. But um, yeah, so the book is about that. And it's about the journey that I had afterward, after I had my son, um, who is very much loved and wanted, which is where the title of the book comes from. <laughs> I believe that you can both want to have had the choice for reproductive health care and love and want your children. Um, but it's, a, you know, it's about... It's about the discovery about what the implications are for curtailing reproductive health care for women and children uh, through my direct experience. I was so surprised to learn about how difficult it was for you in this day and age mm -hmm. in a state that allows abortion to get it. And you went through in the book so clearly like, well, if I had done this, I would have had to give up this many days of work and this would have cost this and this bus ride would have cost this. And you right. know, if this, then I tried this other option. And then this doctor said no. And, um, I just, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe, and you were saying that this goes on all over the country. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm from New York City and I, mm -hmm. you, you just don't know what it's like. And you were, you had been coming from LA at the time. So it was like a culture shock. Yeah, it was unbelievable to me as a person who grew up in New York and then lived in Los Angeles. And um, our family lived in New York City for many years. And we lived in Los Angeles for many years. And I, it was shocking to me that those, um, you know, there, there are laws that prevent women from being able to seek re reproductive health care in states like West Virginia and many other states. It's not just West Virginia. As a matter of fact, you know, the majority of health care providers are in New York City and or around New York and Los Angeles, California. And the reason why we don't understand this to be a daily situation is because those providers are near those cities. <laughs> right. um, yeah. So there are many states that only have one uh, facility for reproductive health care. Um, and the numbers are, are going down and down and down as time goes on. There are fewer and fewer places to be able to get reproductive health care. But again, like you, I didn't, you know, until I, I saw that directly, I, I, was, uh, I was unaware, completely surprised. And also, um, you know, in that surprise, I felt crazy. <laughs> you know, I felt like, why do I feel like this is impossible? What is wrong with me? But in fact, it was because it was impossible. <laughs> but, you know, it took me a long time. And part of the reason I wrote the book is for that reason. Because the, you know, the ways in which I was told indirectly that the choice was not mine to make because it was too hard to make caused me to doubt everything about myself, including you know, who I was as a mother to my two daughters. And the fact that you had to go through that with no support and no help and struggling financially and mm -hmm. no fit, you know, your mother was, I mean, I'm glad she came through for you at one point in the book. I was like, well, thank <laughs> God for this. Finally, there she shows up. Um, but also your tragic history with your sister, which was mm -hmm. the topic of your previous memoir. Can you mm -hmm. talk a little about that too? 
Yeah. Um, yeah. I re- really put you in the, throw you in the fire <laughs> this morning. Like what here's the a of Jeff, your most painful things in life for me. Let me tell that. you. No. Yeah, let, let me tell you. <laughs> um, yeah. I, when I was in my twenties, I, I, my identical twin sister, Kara died, um, of a heroin overdose. And, um, she had suffered from, depression as a result of having been raped by a stranger in the woods when we were in our early to mid twenties. And, uh, she had a six year, um, you know, struggle after that attack and eventually succumbed to, you know, depression and addiction. And the book is about identity. It's called her a memoir. And, you know, it's about what it means to climb your way out of unimaginable grief. And I, you know, I wrote it because I feel like, uh, people want to know what it's like to have a twin and they want to know what it's like to have, you know, intimate love in that way. And we don't talk about losing that very often. (laughs) And I felt a responsibility to do that. And I felt a responsibility also to talk about what it means to be um, trying to care for somebody who's been sexually assaulted and not really know how to do that. In, in a way, like I, and I didn't realize the trajectory of my writing career had to do with activism and it does, <laughs> you know, this book, this book does that too. And I, I, you know, I am now experiencing myself as somebody who, you know, is not only interested in writing, but interested in justice and justice for women and sharing our stories in a way to liberate us. That's great. I mean, that's like a perfect tagline for a career. Like that's, that's great. You know, um, it's great to have such a clear goal and, you know, a, a marketing firm would say, this is fantastic. You know, you've, you've outlined your, your mission, <laughs> um, but I'm so sorry. I don't even mean to make light of your horrific experience and oh. your tragic loss of your sister. And um, it's just awful uh, what happened. And I need to go back now because after I finished this book, um, I was like, oh my gosh, how did I miss her first book? So anyway, now I have to go back and read it. Um, it sounds like you've been through the ringer in so many ways. Um, and it's like, at least they should give you the choice of whether or not to have another baby. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, I, I think, you know, we all deserve, we all deserve that choice and we deserve to be, you know, in situations where healthcare is strong enough for us to be able to make that choice. Um, and once you have your baby to be taken care of. Yes. Which that was the other know, thing in the book about like all the pitfalls and misdiagnoses essentially of, mm-hmm. with your son. Oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. I wanted to like scoop you up and like take you to my doctor and <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to go to my doctor too. <laughs> I know, I know you did. I know. Oh my gosh. I wanted to. I don't mean to make light of any of these things. I do think, though, there's a way in which you know, if you don't approach something with humor and levity, you're never going to be able to communicate the thing that you need to communicate. And all these things did happen, and miraculously, I'm okay. <laughs> you know, and um, I, I, I want, I want to be able to teach women and, you know, people to be able to go through these experiences and still be okay and to be able to look at them and, you know, help other people. But um, yeah, we deserve, we deserve to have good health care. We deserve to have good reproductive health care. We deserve to have good pediatric care for our children. And the thing that I discovered in this, you know, I'm looking at my book here, which is the galley copy. Yeah. Wait, let you me know. see the cover again. I had to read it online and there wasn't a cover yet. Oh, I love it. It's awesome. Yeah. It's a picture of Morgantown, West Virginia that um, was taken by a local photographer, not very far from the house where I lived. Um, and P.S., I would not say this was exactly an advertisement for Morgantown, West, West Virginia. I feel like <laughs> I'm not sure they're going to like have the biggest book party for you there. I feel like I, don't, like, yeah, I can't say that many people have acknowledged that it's happening. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, <I'm>, yeah. <laughs> I can't say that's the case, yeah. um, <laughs> but I have a lot of love for the place, even though I had, um, you know, difficult times there for sure. I did um, unexpectedly. So, but you know, the thing that I discovered is that states that cur- curtail access to women's health care, and you know, curtailing access to abortion is not just curtailing access to abortion. In fact, it's curtailing access to pap smears and all sorts of women's health care that, you know, is only available to certain people in places that perform abortions. And, you know, it just so happens that 
the money that is funneled into women's uh, health care is when you take it away, you all you don't get adequate care for children. And that's something that occurs across the United States in which I didn't realize until after I had my son. Um, he was born um, with some issues that were not easily taken care of in West Virginia, but would have probably been noticed in a second someplace that had more resources, less over, less overcrowding. Yeah. And then you think of um, spread of COVID across the country, and then you realize like the how can small towns everywhere focus, and when they don't have the advantages of all the science and all the expertise necessarily of bigger communities. I mean, and that's mm -hmm. what most people are turning to. Anyway, it's just mm -hmm. kind of frightening to be honest, but. Yeah, it is frightening. I mean, in my case, I lived in a, in a West, in um, a town where West Virginia University is, which is where I taught, teach. And I, uh, you know, the medical center there is vast. It runs the state. And it's a, it's a historically really interesting place because my Mylan Pharmaceuticals is based there. And this giant medical complex is based there. And so there's a history of healthcare there that's really interesting. Um, however, because West Virginia does not have a lot of medical offices, it is serving the entire state, basically. So there are people who need to commute two and a half hours to be able to see a doctor for any reason. And that includes women who are pregnant, you know, and having babies. There was that one scene where the mom came in with her child and waited for two hours or had to drive mm -hmm. two hours and then she couldn't mm -hmm. miss any more work and had to turn around and leave. It's just heartbreaking. Cause then of course you realize how often this must be happening. Yeah. All over the place, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, it's happening all over the place and it, ha it happened to me, a professor, you know, somebody who, is you know, uh, has two master's degrees and writes books and is a white woman. And the, the number of women that this happens to who are women of color and poor women is astronomical. And I feel like we don't really have enough of a voice for that yet. I feel like as women, we haven't been able to articulate this yet because there's something about being, you know, saying, I thought about having an abortion that is still a really taboo subject. And it's one that I came up against when I was writing the book. I mean, I asked myself consistently, can I do this? Why am I doing this? What does it mean for my son to do this? I, I, I have the answers now, but as I was making my way through it, I did not have those answers. I just had, I just had the desire to be able to say something that didn't feel like it was being said often enough. So what, was, what were some of those answers? Well, <laughs> <Deep down. laughs> I, I'll tell you. <laughs> I, you know, I have two daughters and I thought about what it was that, you know, I would say to them in, you know, two decades from now, a decade from now, uh, about what it meant to live in this time and not advocate for their health care. And I know that, I mean, I, I look to my mother and I say, what did you do in your time and place? And I remember being really disappointed by the fact that I didn't feel like she did a lot, you know, in the 70s when she was growing up in the 60s. And she didn't have the opportunity to do that. You know, she worked at Sears Roebuck and she, you know, she was a waitress after that. She didn't have the, the resources that I have. Um, but, uh, you know, I look to my daughters and I think I will not forgive myself if I don't advocate for them, because if I don't do it, who will, you know? And I think that my son will grow up in a household of girls, of a strong mother, and he will understand that this necessity, uh, you know, is one that doesn't have a lot to do with having him be loved or wanted at all. It happens to be something that makes a better world for him too, for his sisters, for his children. And I think he'll understand. It was a risk that I had to take in order to take care of them all. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you have to, I mean, you have to protect the ones you have. For, well, anyway, I won't get into it, but <laughs> I, I get it. You know, I mean, this is like, you know, Sophie's choice or something, but yes, um, I understand. And I'm glad you came to terms with it and, and crystallized your point in doing it all and, and all of that. Are you, um, can I just ask him for like, so are you and your husband good these days? Like I mean, I we're, we're trying. Okay. <laughs> it was a horrific experience to go through in a marriage. You know, it was, and the time after my son was born was not easy either. I don't write about it, but you know, the, la 
the last couple of years have been hard for everyone. I mean, we're living in a chaotic country in which, you know, we're not sure what tomorrow will look like in a whiplash news cycle. We both happen to be writers, <laughs> my husband and me. And um, uh, there's a way in which that career breeds uncertainty. But I don't know. I mean, it's something that we haven't, I mean, he was really worried about my writing this book. Uh, be, I, you know, I think he wanted, he was worried about our son in a way that I, you know, I'm also worried about our son, but as a man, intimately concerned with his needs in that way and where I was concerned with our daughter's needs. Um, but yeah, no, it's been hard. We're trying to work it out. I don't know what'll happen, to be honest. It's like, <laughs> it could go, it could go either way, but right now we're, you know, still married. Okay. <laughs> um okay i'll just leave that alone <laughs> <laughs> well let me just i just i want to say something about this you know one of the things that i'm asked a lot about is what my husband thinks about this book and you know that's a that's an interesting subject but i think that when you take a subject like this and you ask about someone's husband and this is no offense to your question because i would ask it too <laughs> in a second I would say, you know, you're making something about uh, what should be about a woman's choice and her role as a mother and turning it around and asking her what her husband thinks is making it less about her and more about him. You know, I did not ask that question. No, 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 no. I'm, <laughs> I'm talking about it in terms of like, what is it about? I, I was thinking about it. I'm like, what? I'm a, I'm a writer of nonfiction. My husband is a writer of nonfiction. We tell stories that you know would be harrowing for other people I and mean, he's written two memoirs and you know there's a take no prisoners approach in his writing that i don't necessarily have in mind but i thought like what is my gut reaction to not wanting to address him because i'm interested in talking about the marriage but what is it about this particular situation that makes me feel nervous about that and i thought because when i look at him i'm taking away something that was really about me and i don't want to do that because it it uh you know, it clouds a situation which is so much, which to me seems so clear in terms of what he would think and feel about, you know, say, for example, me having an abortion. You know, he immediately, when he found out that I was pregnant, said, it is your body and your choice. I guess, I guess if, I mean, I didn't ask what he would think um, about it. I was more interested in like, are you two okay? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, just wondering what the conclusion was. But I guess... I would be wondering because you didn't paint such a great picture of your relationship essentially mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. revealing that has effects on the other on both people in the part you know both members yeah. of the party so that's that would be it not not even um about it actually had nothing to do with the abortion part i mean i think that's obviously one piece of your book but certainly not the other piece i mean i also think it's about how do you handle how do you get through being a mother in, in a marriage when life is really, 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 really hard? Mm -hmm. And I think that's like a big piece of your book, regardless of the reproductive angle. Yeah. Um, it's the day-to-day -day life and the struggling and the financial stress that weighs on you and mm -hmm. the blame and um, you know, his career versus yours. Like I just felt yeah. like so much of this was so widely applicable. And that's why I was oh gosh, yeah. you know, that's not um I mean, I don't know. And also abortion has so many political and religious and, you know, whatever. I was kind of like not dealing with that because people have such different views on it. However, I was just trying to get to like... Yeah. Yeah. I totally understand what you're saying. And you know, the thing is that any marriage has its complications. And, um, you know, I talk to my girlfriends and we're all talking about, oh my God, you know, how what is what is our what are our financial lives going to be like this year and what you know how does that impact our marriage and who's getting to work right now it's like it, you know uh, is is my husband getting to work am i getting to work who's taking care of the children and just like no matter what the mess like the the tangle of your life is i think we all in some way are adjacent to that in that kind of stress and keeping a marriage together is so hard you know <laughs> it's, it's really hard and that doesn't mean that you don't love somebody it doesn't mean you don't want to be with them it just means that it's hard and it's not just hard for me it's hard for all of us you know like you show me the perfect marriage <laughs> i want to see it um uh, yeah, but as a writer of nonfiction, it's my job to tell the truth. So, well, even still, many writers of nonfiction don't delve this deep into their own marriages. So, yeah. um, especially 
as a young, like I feel like some authors do it when they're older, like reflecting back, like, mm-hmm. you know, Danny Shapiro wrote a beautiful memoir called Hourglass about her. Oh, I love that. Marriage. I love that. Mar- I love right? that. So beautiful. So good. Yeah. I love but it. I feel like it's not as often that you hear from the, the inside. I feel like there's this, oh, sorry, that was my dog. I'll delete this. Um, I feel like there's this, you know, like almost like iron wall sometimes around people's inner relationships that you didn't have, which was great, which is what made your book, in part, what made your book, I think, so interesting and unputdownable is because you're like, well, what's going to happen next? How did they navigate this? How would I navigate that? Right? You know what I mean? You put yourself in your shoes and and right. go through it with you. So anyway. Oh, thank you. I mean, I do feel, I do feel like if I didn't write about the marriage, the book wouldn't ring true. I had to, I had to do it in order to tell the story. There was no way around it. Trust me. I thought about it. I need to do this. And the answer was always yes. And to do it respectfully and with love realizing that, you know, the out, the outcome was going to be something that I felt would be helpful to people and that, you know, there's always the do no harm. And, you know, I just, I just wanted to look at it from all angles. There was, I, I, there was really no way to write this book without that. Everywhere I hit in the story, the marriage was there looking at me. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I got divorced after being married for 10 years, um, Mm -hmm. and I am now remarried. So after this, if you ever want to ask me any questions, (laughs) I'm I'm, I'm around. I'm around. So whatever. I'll Zoom you. (laughs) Yeah, Zoom me. I'm I'm around. Um, Anyway, so tell me a little more about the actual writing of this story. Like when on earth did you find time, especially given how you painted your life, to to write a book on top of everything else? Well, um, I had um, the great fortune of working for an employer that gave me parental leave after I had my son. So I was on a paid leave for a semester. Um, And um, I mean, there was really not a lot of time to work after having that baby, obviously. And he was not well. I was literally hooked up to a milk machine, you know, a pump for the first four and a half months of his life because he was never able to nurse. And then having the two girls running around uh, me while I did that, it was so, it was so hard, but you know, the, th- I just like pure drive and grit made me write. <laughs> I was, I, I wanted, I wanted, I needed, I needed to get this book out. So to out of my soul. And so, you know, I would type it on the side uh, while my son was napping and my daughters were, you know, like wrestling around the living room. <laughs> But I did. And, you know, my husband was working full time at that point. He had gotten a job in television in Los Angeles, which, you know, it's like a more than 12 hour a day job that also involves frequent travel. So, you know, those first six months of Keats, my son, that's his name, Keats, his life was uh, not full of a lot of work, but I did the best I could. And then um, he got a little older and I got I found a great child care provider and every free minute that I had, I invested in writing this book. And then I uh, used my summer vacation to write the book. <laughs> and then I had to take leave off of my teaching for a semester to finish it. Wow. Unpaid. There was no way to do it. Um, but are you still working for the same university? Yes, I am. I teach remotely right now, like, you know, so many people. But yeah, I do, t- I do still teach for the university. But you left West Virginia. But I left West Virginia. Okay. Yeah, I did. I left West Virginia because I didn't feel like I could live there anymore, <laughs> which was a really, you know, this book is also about homesickness and sadness. And it's also about asking uh, where you can, you know, like what it means to be from a place. And okay. I felt, even though it hurt me to live there in so many ways, that there was so much of me that loved it. And my, you know, my daughters loved it. <laughs> so it was a very hard decision, but one that I felt like I had to make after, you know, looking at the facts and knowing that, you know, if I felt like I had a heart attack in the middle of the night and I had to call an ambulance that it might not turn out okay. <laughs> so. And how, how is Keats? Is he okay now? Oh, he's so wonderful. He's so great. He's healthy. He's and how old is he now? Like three or something? Two and a half. 
Two and a half. Wow. He's two and a half. He's just starting to put together complex sentences. And he's my big helper. Like, he's the neatest of all the kids. If you look at him and he's playing in the play kitchen, like, wiping down the counters. <laughs> 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 he, he's just a sweet little love and he's healthy and doing so well oh yeah so great um so are you trying to write any more books on the side or do you are you content with the chaos that your regular life <laughs> I have another book I have another book that I'm working on right now okay. and I had been working on it before this book so it was a book that I'd been working on um and then when I realized that I needed to write loved and wanted and my publisher wanted to have it in time for the election um I had to put that other book aside but yeah. it's a deep love of mine um it's a it's a non-fiction book about a woman who was a CIA operative during the bin Laden years and she worked at the top of asset conversion while also so being involved in um, a really awful marriage that involved domestic violence and not being able to tell anybody about that because it compromised national security. Whoa. Yeah. And I met her through a friend and she's just, you know, I, it, it, that story changed my life because I realized that, and you know, it I probably, obviously it influenced this book too. Cause I thought, what does it mean to be a woman working in the world at the top of your game and still have, you know, this closet full of secrets and shame. <laughs> you know? So I'll finish that book. I'm about halfway through now, but um, obviously I'm taking time with the kids and teaching and remote school is hard. <laughs> so. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> um, wow, that book sounds awesome. Um, do you have any advice for aspiring authors? Put your rear end in the chair <laughs> and don't worry about it not being good the first draft. Because it's, um, you know, the, it's so important to be able to get your story out and not to stop yourself by telling yourself lies like this isn't good enough and who will care about this, you know, that that's my biggest piece of advice. And also, if you can, to find a group of readers that you trust and engage yourself with them because writing is a solitary experience, but it's also a community experience because you have a reader. <laughs> it's not just about, you know, it's not just about you. It's about, you know, what it, what it means to have a conversation with somebody who picks up your book. Wow. I love that. And I have to tell you in terms of like the reader, I read this book. I couldn't sleep. I sometimes get like all this pain in my body, whatever. Anyway, it was the middle of the night and I read the whole thing walking in circles around my apartment, standing up on my iPad. Oh my <laughs> <For> like, <laughs> I read like the first 150 pages, just like roaming around in circles and like so in it in the dark with just the light of the iPad. So I felt like so <laughs> connected to it. And then I finished the rest the next day. But um, anyway, it was like this very, <laughs> yeah, it was like very intense moment, you know, especially cause like you, I feel Feel like your life I don't know I was like in your life in the middle of my night like in like a dream state or something anyway so it was awesome I loved it I will thank, um, thank you <laughs> yeah, no, that, um, was the, that was the aim you know the aim was like how do I write a book where I feel like I can put my arm around you and just tell you this thing that happened to me and yes. we can just be together in the dark with an iPad <laughs> yes exactly well mission accomplished check you know <laughs> Um, well, thanks so much for chatting with me today and for giving me the <laughs> conclusion to your story, which I was like, what's happening now? So thanks for that too. And, um, yeah, I'm excited for your book to be out in the world. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me and for having this conversation. This is the first one that I've had about the book. No way. Oh my gosh. It's been on my calendar. When I first heard about this book, like forever ago, I was like, yes. I can't wait. And so it's been one of my longest and it did not disappoint me. So anyway. Oh, well, thank you. Thank All you right. so, so much. All right. Good, Good luck, luck with everything. Okay. <laughs> Bye-bye.